We were kind of waiting for Martha, but we didn't. Maybe we didn't get the message. She's not coming. So um, I guess we better get started. So I'll open up the meeting, and we've got enough to. So here we go. So Michelle, so, um, are you uh, good with uh, the minutes? Yes. The book meeting. Yes. Yeah. The two oh, oh. meetings. Mm -hmm. Two. Yeah. Both sides. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a meeting. Yeah. Okay. So the <coughs> minutes for both both meetings are approved. And uh, we could take some public comment if somebody here that wants to something to say. It's the 16th and the 24th. You have that? Yeah. yeah. Guess not. Okay. Uh, you want to talk about Fort Brook Road for a second as an adjustment to the agenda? Uh, we can do that. I, yep. I, I just wanted to uh, suggest maybe writing Mr. Johnson a letter and canceling our 20, our, our special meeting. That's just an idea. I didn't know how anybody else thought. Don't we have to go there first? Don't we have to make a visit? You, have to, you need to make a determination that it's not up to, not up to standard. Um, and I sent out the, the map from Two Rivers that clearly states that even the most level area is still above 8%. It's uh, between 8 and 16 percent slope. Um, so we don't have to make a visit. I don't mind going, but I just save everybody's time. But yeah, no, I, I would only want to go if I had to go. We already know that it doesn't qualify, so. You're not going to make it unless he lops off a whole lot of dirt and granite. Um, you're not going to get from 16 to less than 8. Yeah, you'd have to put in uh, a number of <coughs> switchbacks <coughs> in a very short distance. And they don't have the land. It's not possible. So the question is, do we have to go? Yes, there are legal because we've been requirements. Asked to. <coughs> I think that um, I'd have to look at it, and I can maybe get back to you. But I think it is. Um, I think you can make a determination that it doesn't meet the standard. I mean, with something like this, that doesn't need to be there. Give me a moment. I can see if I can find the credit card. Maybe you could be convinced to withdraw his application. No, I mean, that's showing coming in. His argument was that it's worked for all these years. We work for the town. That doesn't do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, Well, I'm just going by what you said at the last meeting, remember? You I think you just need to make the determination. Usually you need okay. to be on site to make that determination. Oh, okay. In this care case, we did it essentially by satellite. But I think that um, the key would be to, you know, notify him in a timely manner and that, you know, we looked into it it's above 8% and therefore, but I think that, for him, you should probably, well, I suppose you can do it here, but um, you know, you may want to actually warn it and put it on the next meeting, it's got, you know, agenda, and actually make an official discussion and invite him to be part of that. Um, okay. But I think based upon that information, I think that it's, it gives you the information that you need to know, and I think that that would probably be sufficient to, you know, render the decision. 
That sounds like a plan. Yeah. Because if he was here, then he yep. maybe he could accept it. Although, except for he said he wasn't going to be able to make them next You're Friday. Right. No. Uh, uh, on the 21st. Oh, yeah, times that one by He said he wasn't going to be there. Yeah, you're right. Um, right. Doesn't necessarily negate the fact that you could put it on the first meeting in November. I mean, at this point, it's kind of a, a moot point to do a site visit based upon the info. Um, you put in that yeah. meeting, and then if for some reason you know, the legality tells me different. We can still keep the date, but, um, you know, I think that you have the needed information. I don't think he can alter the course of that. Um, you know, I think that you would need to bring that up to standard. You can tell him that in a meeting, you know, a warn meeting, and, you know, I think that the first meeting in November would be fine. You know, we don't need to be on site. We don't need to fight daylight. We don't need to do any of that. Yeah. We can just present essentially the printout and, and go from there. Okay. I can I can send an email. Okay, let's, let's do that. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. No, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> okay, well, let's see. I suppose we could do the building ordinance first here. Uh, you may want to, uh, I think John's saying <coughs> come, so you may want to do, um, oh. you want to do the select oh. center steps first. Because do we need, because, okay, I was thinking of these guys. Yeah, um, <laughs> I told John, you know, like, it would take a little bit to get through the rec center steps, so okay. not to, didn't have to All right. five thirty. So it's worth waiting for. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's do that then. We'll, I guess uh, we've got some information here in the emails. You got to memorize it. No, but I didn't. It's also a little hard to follow, but I can see that. I got one here. We are way over budget. <coughs> One thing that I think about is that we've already got quite a lot invested in the platform. Right. You know, fixing it underneath and right. fixing the edge. I know. And there's nothing wrong with the steps. Really, they aren't quite up standard, but they're okay. So the problem is those two developments. And it's hard to imagine I, that somebody I, could spend that much money. Uh, I know. Fixing I, them. It's I just inconceivable to me. Mm -hmm. no. Is it because there's so few people willing to do this job that... I think that's part of the problem. We've got better yeah. things to do. Okay. So to give you, just to expand on, so I did send you uh, an email string between myself and Chris Cole, uh, the engineer that um, we've had assist us on this project. And I also sent you an email from... James Woods and Son, um, they had their mason look at it, um, and he provided some feedback. So, you know, we started off with uh, Charlie Brennan, uh, who was lower than the 25,000, like 10,000, um, but um, he's not carrying the insurance that you'd like to see him carry. Um, along the way, there's always been you know, I like the guy, he does good work, but there's always some stories kind of along with the work as to whether it's, you know, ultimately leads to some problems, whether they were his problems that are kind of there before, or whether just how good of a job he does. Um, you know, I've seen some of his work, I think he does decent work, but um, there's always been kind of a question mark there, uh, but he was willing to do the work and he was less than the 10,000. Um, there was also really nobody else interested in doing the job. Uh, the first time we went out to bid, um, Chris Cole had some communication with Dave Jocelyn, who you see the communication from. 
he comes in at $25,000 range. Again, he is a contractor, he's a general contractor, so there's a markup there, um, but his is his mason. Um, he does do historical work. Uh, seems to think his mason can do the work. Um, and Chris Cole seems to think the work can be done. Um, there was the email from Jansowitz and Son, which is even higher than that. Kind of like, you know, I've looked at it, I'm concerned that once I get into this and start peeling away, you know, I'm gonna be peeling away forever down to nothing. And, you know, I would budget like 50 grand. Um, you know, I'm not sure it can even be done type response. So, you know, I've asked Chris, you know, him and I batted around the idea of just putting it back out to bid in January. Let's yeah. just go back out to bid, see what we get. Mm -hmm. Um, he's, you know, on board with that, but he doesn't seem to think that the response will be any stronger than what we got, you know, last time around. Uh, and the answer is, is that it is, um, it's not something your everyday mason can do. It is specialized, um, you know, people are busy or they don't want to take the time to kind of, you know, bid something out and, you know, spend a fair amount of time on it and there's a chance that they may not get the job, you know, is that kind of, um, you know, it's that kind of a specialty job to it. Um, you know, you're literally talking about, you know, inserting an intricate web of wire to kind of, you know, build the reinforcement and kind of build the cement off of that and put in certain layers of, of I'm trying to think of the word, but, uh, kind of adhesive layers that you build out from that. Um, they, that's what Chris Cole does. You know, he came from Preservation Trust of Vermont. Um, he did our first assessments. Um, you know, that's kind of, it's kind of why I'm bringing this to you. And it's, you know, we did budget $17,000 for the work. Um, so it's about a $7,000, $8,000 overage. Uh, we had 20,000 altogether, um, although there was some money in there for Chris Cole's time, although he's put in most of his time at this point on the front end, but he was going to make a couple of visits out to on site to ensure that it was being done you know, appropriately. So I think we're at a point where, you know, this is, this gentleman is lining it up for the springtime. Uh, it's not something he's gonna do in the fall. Um, they're pretty well, busy at this point in time. Um, nobody's gonna come in at this point and do it, but um, if we were to communicate with Mr. Jocelyn and, um, you know, show an interest, then we would probably, you know, retain him and, and you know, he would put us in the queue for the springtime. Uh, otherwise, we'd go out to bid and not sure what we'd get, whether it be, yeah, maybe just the mason without the general contractor, which might make it less, but then again, somebody may not even bother with it. So it's kind of... Is, is this a bid or an estimate? We bid it out. Uh, at this point in time, this is what he's saying that he would do it for. So we went to Jocelyn and Jansowitz after the bids after the bids came back, and we had Charlie Brennan. Charlie Brennan didn't present the info, you know the insurance that we were looking for. So we were left with essentially no one at that point in time. So we poked around and see if anybody was interested. Um, both of these said they were interested. Jocelyn said, yeah, we can't. That's not something that can be done. Jancewood said that. Jocelyn said, yep, I can do it for 25 grand. So Mr. Cole was talking about um, putting it together, combining it with other projects we might have. So that runs into somewhat of a budgetary issue, but he seemed to think that your per project cost would come down a bit, you know, so we got a similar problem with Damon Hall on the front steps here. And these steps. Um, the Nature Society steps. 
one building at a time. <laughs> oh, no, no, the same building, yeah, yeah. Damon Hall. Yeah. So they're all front steps and side steps or similar. <laughs> so he just seemed to think that, you know, if he, if he's got more, you know, going on that, you know, the per project, you know, he's literally going to go from there down to here and, you know, he's be set up and your per project cost would come down. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, we've got the essentially 20 grand budgeted for the rec center steps. We're just in the process of doing budgeting for next year. So it would be something that if the money was still there after the fiscal year, um, and we could, that was something that we could carry over, um, you know, we could budget for next year. Um, we do have the sale of the 21 house going through, um, which would alleviate some of that. We've been carrying a deficit, so that makes it a little bit difficult to do, um, but. But those steps, these nature society steps, yep. Damon Hall steps, you know, front and side, they could, they could be for the next fiscal year, right? I mean. Yeah, the only, it's it's kind of an accounting glitch uh, in that it may be, and again, the sale of the 21 house may alleviate that, but usually, all things considering, let's just say, you know, your revenues and expenses came out perfect, you know, and you had the $20,000 left from the rec center left over, you know, technically you can carry that through and with voter permission, you can apply that to next year's budget. We've been carrying a deficit, so that carryover isn't as clean as, as until we get the final audited numbers and we know kind of what we're expecting and where it lands after the 21 house. So it's not as easy as, you know, okay, that money is just there. In municipal accounting, it literally goes from year to year budgetary and um, it would just be a little bit difficult to forecast what is exactly there for next year left over from this year. Seems like working out the accounting would be an easier job than working what? Working out the accounting would be a, a, a more reasonable solution than making it into two jobs that would make us, that would cost us more. I mean, I think that, that is a reasonable, a reasonable approach, seems to me, to make the job bigger, to save money. And knowing that, especially knowing that these other steps do need to be fixed. I think what he's telling us is it's too small a job to get, to get a good deal on. I wouldn't quite agree with you on the accounting part of that. The only thing that may make it easier is the sale of the 21 house. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we expect that to happen. We, we do. So what would you say if that goes through? And does that make this look feasible to enlarge the scope of the job? Personally, I would budget the 20000 and anything extra again next year and wouldn't count on a carryover from year to year. You really can't. It's really just not built that way. Yeah, but so I'm not gonna, even thinking of carryover. So you're going to have to, so if you go into next year, you'll need to budget, let's just say it goes from, let's just say it's 23000 instead of twenty five. So you're going to have to budget the 23000 for the rec center steps. And then you're going to have to budget the, the Damon Hall as well. Well, we've already budgeted for the rec center. For this year, we did. Right. And so, let, and so we have till June 30th to spend it. Correct. Okay, so then this year, now, we're working on the budget process, so we include Damon Hall steps. So provided he does the job in June, and then that carries over him over to July 1st, <laughs> which would be... <laughs> so I'd say we straddle the fiscal year. He does, he does the rec center in that's June. Kind of, you know, that's what that works. Dave. It's a reasonable thing to ask him to accommodate. Do you think that the first guy would do it for if we covered his insurance overhead or not? Yes, I'm doing that too. <clears throat> um, if we didn't have to deal with insurance, he would probably do it. I think that's kind of a bad habit. 
Where's the sky jostling from? Down um, south of us. I can't remember the town exactly. Windsor? Uh, a little bit farther down than anyone. <laughs> no, he's out of, he's down towards Andover. I don't know where Andover is. <laughs> it's outside of Chester. Chris Brennan, that's the name of the first contractor. Charlie. Charlie. Uh, does he have any employees? Yes, that's the one. That's the, that's the concern. So he's not just a one man. Correct. All right. No, oh, that's what the insurance. I, yeah. Because yeah. it was just one person. That's it, why I. I legally, that, he so. should. Legally, he should have the insurance for the for the employee. They like to say it's an independent contractor, but. Cut out insurance. I mean, some, somebody might get tangled up in his work and get hurt or something. Especially if it's what it is. I mean, there's a big differential, you know. You never know. You know, he could hit his head and we're carrying him for the next yeah. two years. No, I agree that someone should have insurance, but yeah. I don't, I mean, it's it's, it's a 15, overhead. It's a $15,000 differential, but I mean, between his, what he's willing to do the work for and what Jocelyn okay. can do the work for. But, I suppose it might be worth him contacting him again. And, and maybe if there was a little more money, he'd, he'd do it. Well, uh, Rick wasn't enthusiastic or wholeheartedly, am I characterizing this correctly? You're not wholeheartedly endorsing Mr. Bradman's work. That doesn't matter. I think we felt as though he was going to need a little bit more oversight than, than somebody else. Some people's work is fine, and others I've heard some comments. You know, he's done some pretty big jobs, so whether yeah. some of the issues were his issues or existing already is kind of tough to decipher. Well, it doesn't look like we're going to have an answer here. What to do? You can bid it out again. You may lose Joss one, but I mean, you know, you can bid it out again would be probably the honest thing to do. Would be what? It's also a reasonable thing to do. Well, we already know there aren't many of them, and it's a small job, and it's a tricky job, and no, not many, I, don't, I don't know what we would gain. I mean, we already know. Well, why don't we put the whole thing on hold, gather together the three jobs, and ask for a bid for next year? If this wasn't an accounting problem, then you would go for it, right? Um, I think there's, you know, I'm concerned about the siding over at the library. I think that that needs to be painted. Um, we took the siding off and put it back on when we did the roof. So I think that that I'd look at before the Damon Hall steps, to be honest with you. Um, I think that that's, that is a, probably an over, I mean, the steps in Damon Hall are certainly concerned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, um, don't think I, you know, we, took the time to not re-side the library when we put the roof on. You know, they took the pieces off and put it back on and they've kind of primed over the, the places and, you know, at this point it's probably a year and a quarter since we've done that. So um, I think that, that probably needs to be addressed. Well, that's, that's good thinking, but if we could save thousands of dollars, 
by combining the projects. That's also a good thing. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't say how much you're going to save. Yeah, you know, I know. I'm not, you know, I don't know yeah, if it's no, Christmas know. and, you know. I know, but we, if, we, if we would just determine that this $25,000 is unreasonable, we're not going to accept it, start over. That might be the way to go on the start over. Even if it isn't in step with what we do first. What's that? Even if it isn't in step with what needs to be done first. Well, I, I mean, you can offset the thousands of dollars that you may save by then reciting, you know, with maybe too, too far gone to begin with now as it is, but, you know, you. I'm just, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that we got a perfect answer here, but, no. you know, I'm, you know, I would, I would probably, my advice would be to either rebid it um, point blank and see what you get, or, you know, you've got somebody interested, it's probably $5,000 more than maybe just a mason in and of himself, but masons in and of themselves don't seem to be banging down the door. I don't think it's a $10,000 job, that's for sure. Unless you want to go with Charlie Brown. Well, uh, the fact that he doesn't carry insurance for his employee, that to me doesn't recommend uh, him to me as a somebody we want to hire. I mean, that's not good business practice. Yeah, I don't see how he could even get away with it, actually. Especially in that line of work. It's crazy. He's, he's got to work as a comp. I mean, and, um, we're talking about other insurance, too. Insurance for the job, for the town. If he doesn't have it and somebody gets hurt, there's the possibility, percent chance that they turn around and say, oh no, I was working for you and, you know, Why not? and no, we can't hire somebody without insurance. You know, and, and, you know, could possibly end up, you know, put ourselves into the workers' comp liability and the longer the person would be out, you know, our rate would go up accordingly. So yeah. probably a race. So he's done, he's out. We're not, we're not gonna consider him. That was an issue when we did the roof uh, to Damon Hall. We had one contract, you know, two contractors that had the insurance and two contractors that didn't. It was a very big discrepancy in, in, in price. Insurance is so expensive. Um, so what would, it, what would we gain by going back out to bid? I mean, are you talking the same specs? Are you, Gordon, are you thinking about well, yeah. We're adding the additional job. I actually don't, well, it could be either, but the, the job, the specs for the job would be the same. But if there's money to be saved by doing the other two steps, which we probably, as Dave is right, we could put those off for five years probably. Wouldn't you think? Really? These are what I don't know. Five minutes. Front door, front steps are. I'm a little worried about the siding over the library. No, not uh, that. No, I'm talking about the I steps. know, but I'm. I, I'm. You're not that worried. I'm then. No, I am then. You know, beyond that, I am then worried about the steps at Damon Hall and the drainage at Damon Hall and the rec center. So. They're a close second, believe me. They're not, okay. they're not far behind. All right. Um, That's all the more reason to move along then. Well. Yeah. I'll probably cast my vote for rebidding one way or another. Well, rebidding one way or another meaning, meaning what? Rebidding just the rec Just steps? that or do the three together. So how about if I have a casual conversation with Mr. Jocelyn about that sounds like good the, the, the Damon Hall steps. If there is any savings. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. And then 
you know, we've got until, I mean, the, the, the bids in the RFP is written. We put it out last spring, so it would be a matter of changing the dates on it and putting it out again. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I can speak to Jocelyn about doing the two. Um, you know, you're still, it's still his sub, and it's still intricate work. You have to peel it back and kind of do more of the same. Yeah, I think people want them done. You know, sick of looking at it. At least that. Orange fencing is gone, but it's really hideous. Those swing walls. It needs to be done. Yeah. You know, it needs to be done. Oh, and, uh, one more question. He said in here something about wooden, oh, or maybe it was Phil that said the wooden steps are historical, historically correct set of wooden steps. Do they used to be wooden, Gordon? Yeah. Where are we talking? Phil is talking about maybe just demolishing the the, the, the concrete steps and starting fresh. Hmm. With wooden steps? Yes. We, we are planning on doing it with the steps themselves, are we? Uh, the steps themselves are okay. I mean, you can't, because of the way, you know, the side is, is failed, you know, you can't really get too far, you know, you don't completely escape the steps, but uh, for the okay. most part, the steps themselves are fine. Yeah, so we're not changing that anyways, okay. as far as I know. So we're just talking about those buttons on yeah. the side that have deteriorated over the 100 years that they've been there. Okay, let's do it that. That way, let's get more information, see what happens. Oh, does that include a uh, contingency, like 10% at bid? Yeah, I get the impression he he will do the work for twenty five thousand. No matter what. Okay. I'd have to confirm. You know, as we progress, we'd I'd have to confirm that. But my understanding is, is I can do that for twenty five thousand. Okay. And if everything goes really well for him, is he going to do it for any less? Or are we going to pay twenty five thousand? <laughs> I can do it for twenty five thousand. Right. <laughs> if I had done a day earlier, it's, that's my life secret. <laughs> I, I, would, I would expect they couldn't. Yeah. Um, no, we couldn't. Oh, well. That sounds like an awful lot to me. I, as you can tell in the email, I was, you know, in my discussion with Chris Cole was, you know, look, this is 50% more than what you estimated to us, um, you know, on what it would take to do this. And I hit him pretty hard on that, on the fact that his... You know, I thought 17 was on the high side. But uh, at the end of the day, if you go over there and look what needs to be done, if you are to maintain those cement steps and build them out, um, it's not, again, your typical mason, you know, the original plan was to essentially like stucco around it and put the bluestone over it, essentially just bury it, um, kind of what we did over, you know, these kind of, I think the Damon Hall steps there isn't the original siding there, but um, so that was, you know, the original plan was not to, you know, essentially rehabilitate it, it was essentially to cover it up. Cover it up. Okay. So you can get us more info. The so minutes are going to be kind of skeletal. Minutes, that's okay. That's okay. Well, perfectly fine. We don't like long minutes. I'm not okay. I'm not okay with that. <laughs> I want to 
nothing to be luxurious, but it's... Okay, we're ready to move on. I can make some stuff up. I gotta say, Mary said all this kind of stuff. We're moving on. I crack myself up. Let's see. So we're ready to talk about building permits. <coughs> So let me, introduce, um, let me introduce this subject. Um, this comes kind of all-inclusive. Um, I did send the um, board John Sanders' email uh, regarding a brush fire that occurred on um, Gilson Farm Road. Brush fire was the, the cause of the brush fire was from an illegal burn. Um, and as they progressed, kind of after the fact or during the fact, um, the resident had a nine uh, had a wrong nine one address. Didn't match the the the, the house didn't match the nine one one mapping, um, and um, it was a rental unit that's somewhat unknown to us. And we have been John and and. Um, Doug, actually, as well, and to a very small point, myself, we've had some conversations with the state fire marshal, fire inspector, um, about um, their need for a more up-to-date list on what the rental units are in town. They do, they do the inspections, and um, they certainly don't feel as though they're getting everything that they're capturing what may be in Heartland. So um, this was one that got passed on to them. Uh, and this also kind of coincides with uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had asked the listers, um, particularly Doug, to kind of go back and, you know, during the reappraisal, what did you come up with during the reappraisal and can we kind of document that in any kind of a way? They've been in the middle of the BCA, so certainly this is, you know, literally it's kind of off the top of his head. He sat down for, you know, three quarters of a day and started thinking of the different roads and kind of worked his way through Heartland. And, you know, literally this is kind of off of his top of his head type thing. But I did ask him to put pictures to it. And um, so that kind of, these two things came together at the same time. And I certainly thought that John's uh, email warranted some discussion at the select board level. Um, and as did the additional information from the listers as far as some of the development that we're seeing out there. Uh, and that we did have a small update in the fact that the grant has been submitted to, uh, by Two Rivers to the state of Vermont for a building permit ordinance. But this all fits together. Primarily, the, 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 the Gilson Farm Road is kind of discerning in the fact that the 9-11 numbers, um, and there can be any number of factors as to why they were wrong. Um, not any one person, but it's just kind of, you know, some things that we're seeing, as well as the rentals um, are a concern. Um, wrapped up in that building permit ordinance is somewhat the discussion of enforcement. And certainly, this is not our first go around with illegal burns and fire departments responding, um, actually multiple towns responding. In this case, um, Windsor and Hartford also responded. We've had some others where Woodstock's been involved or et cetera. So um, what I guess I'm trying to say is that this is not, or this is certainly a noticeable issue for the town both from a response point of view and from a development point of view. Um, all of the, the stuff on Doug's hand out there did get captured in the reappraisal, uh, but it did take, uh, some of it was before the reappraisal, working with John Fife and uh, the consultants, but certainly it kind of took a reappraisal to get and capture most of this. But even with the listers involved, um, you can certainly see a system that is not overly effective uh, in pulling this together. And I think that that's been my point um, leading up to this. And I'm using this situation here to try and pull some of this together. Um, and I think that um, you know, John and Doug want to add to that, or if you have any questions for John, um, what he's seeing out there, if you want him to expand on what happened in Gilson Farm Road or, or some of the other places. And certainly, if you have any questions on some of the development that's there, um, I counted 36 new houses um, in about a little over two years. Um, not only is the potential to miss that on the grand list, but that's just 
fair amount of development um, going on um, around town. It's not, you know, like we're, we're you know, um, what's the thing? The tumbleweeds are going through town. Um, you know, a ghost town? What's that? A ghost town? Is that what I, <laughs> tumble -a, tumble -a. I think, you know, westerners and tumbleweeds. But uh, certainly there's a fair amount of activity. Yeah. And the activity affects first response, it affects, um, you know, roads, affects road use, um, it affects um, just the burden on municipal resources, um, means more, you know, people into C. Clyde, more people into C. Martin, just more activity, and, um, you know, I, I think that in the past, uh, what has been missing from this discussion is how it affects the town internally, not necessarily how it affects the property owner or, you know, I'm not talking property rights, I'm not talking about painting your house, you know, white instead of tan. Where are you going to put it? I'm just saying structurally um, to understand, to respond to fires, to respond and get the information on the grand list. Um, there's some of this uh, on here, again, at the low end. Um, concerns from a septic point of view um, and communicating with or, or following up on that. So there's, um, it affects the town and how we operate, the revenue that we get in, um, how effectively we do that and um, how hard it is on the employees, whether it be the listers or the fire department in trying to navigate this. Um, not saying there's any perfect answer. Not saying it all goes away um, if we implement certain policies and procedures, but certainly um, I think there's room for improvement. So this list, I counted 54 properties. Uh, does that mean that they weren't taxed? No, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Sorry. After speaking with Dave about this, I was trying to put that if we had a permit system, this is what's going on in the last couple of years. So this is how active we are. If we had permit systems, we'd have 50 or 60 permits uh, representing this. But you know, at that rate, you know, maybe maybe it's going to be something like 25 to 30 a year. Kind of in my complete guesstimate, just based on what I think is going on. That's not just in addition to dwellings. There's people putting up significant barns yeah. or. Technically, you know, anytime you put up anything over 100 square feet, we're supposed to catch it and fairly uh, assess people for it. So, so there's kind of two things. One is, I, I think that if there were a system, then we would know more about it and we could more fairly tax people because people who are paying taxes on what they owe, they're doing the right thing. You get people building houses or significant structures going untaxed, that's not fair to anybody. So that's, that's my main thing about it. And then the other thing was just my observation about the 911 stuff when I was first doing this. I remember, you know, especially Barber Lane, I was like, that's crazy. There's two Barber Lanes. These numbers aren't sequential. They don't jive with anything. They need like a signpost in the middle of that place. That was, that was slow us down in response. You know, and I'm just like, I can't believe that. Or you go to other places that are, wow, you, I, I, I've got a, a Honda with some clearance on it, and I'm barely making it up there. I don't know how you get up there with a truck. You know, you see these certain places or they're either misnumbered or it's a it's a road that doesn't look like it would, you know, if you're driving an emergency vehicle like that, you know, just struck me as being, wow, that's at risk, it seems like. So that, that's my other thing. And I actually put something in the town report two years ago about that. I'm just I'm really struck by how many people either don't have a house number or they're, they're on a private road with no numbers or something like that. It's just like, unless you have to know, wow, this seems like a big risk. Mm. I wouldn't want my daughter to live in a place like that. I'd make sure she had a house number and a street number. It me. But, so I was just surprised by how many places I found that. Like that. The last five pictures, Mary, are actually um, are somewhat are not new. I, and again, Doug got cut short because we got into the BCA hearings. But I started to have him compile a list of uh, concerning rentals. Yeah. Um, you know, 
a couple of them, you know, just the layout and, and concern of trying to respond to, you know, the one on Independence Drive, there's like four, at least four um, units in there that aren't laid out well or, or uh, just troublesome, not to mention you got to get up there and get past uh, Ed Tobin's place just to get there. It's kind of beyond, it is to Ed Tobin's and then beyond, yep. if you can imagine that. Yep. Um, the Maxim property is concerning and, and uh, being able to get a truck to respond to, they've got at least two structures that are rentals on the actual property. I think we talked last meeting about maybe some rentals down towards rent Route 5, but there's some actually up towards, I'll call it the homestead for lack of a better term, um, that, you know, and again, I'm not sure a building permit would address it other than to notify us that it's going to be a problem to respond, um, but that's one that's going to be, you know, problemsome to respond. and. Uh, we sent, you know, that was kind of unchecked, and we sent the, the fire inspector to that one, you know, and he even had difficulty deciphering what exactly was there and what wasn't because the property owner isn't necessarily cooperating, you know, type thing. So, um, you know, there's a couple others on there as well, but the last five, and I think that that, we could probably add at least another, you know, to that as well. Um, you know, we got Martinsville Road on there. Um, it's actual, you know, I've got, I think this is pretty well public knowledge, it's an absolute disaster down there. Um, we've got one person I know well living in one of those units. It's just, you know, I'm not sure, you know, how, I'm not sure how that works, but, um, you know, it's, you've got multiple buildings down there that certainly don't fall within anything in it, but I'm, I'm not sure if they're even numbered or... Well, they were, right, there was a, uh, literally on the Martin Villa Road, I think that's one of those pictures, it's like a summer pop-up camper with bales of hay around it and tarps over it, an extension cord running into it. And the people were living there all winter. Yeah. And also on that property, there's another, more like a, a, a camper, uh, you can drive a truck with a thing on it that people were also living essentially in the dorm room. An extension for um, And those are also like crowded right up into the road. Like, I don't know how you could plow that road. You know, you're going to watch it there or something. It's not even a normal width last winter. Or so it, and that's not something, you know, the oversight on our part there would just be a matter of communicating with, a, you know, with particular state agencies to, you know, ensure that, you know, there's some sort of, um, you know, we're not responsible for that oversight, but certainly that, you know, someone is aware of, of that and, um, and, and what's going on there. Because certainly, you know, in some of these instances, um, you know, we've been somewhat lucky, actually, to be truthful on, on our responses, um, that we've been able to get there or climb over the, well, the garbage or whatever. There's a, I mean, Barbara Lane is a great example of, I'm gonna park the truck here, and I'm gonna send one firefighter up that driveway and another one up that driveway until we figure out where this house is. And there's a bunch of foot traffic that happens before we finally then commit a truck to going up any one of those traffic. Finding the residence is the hard, can be the hardest part. I'm getting there when it's not a big column of black smoke coming. So what are you recommending in terms of this building permit thing? A, a process that is systemically followed is what I would advocate for. Mm -hmm. And how you do that, I think, is something you can offer advice on. But uh, you know, the tax map, the 911 map, and the sign on the front of the house should all be the same. No. Mm -hmm. Here's an example of this. Gilson yeah. Roadhouse that's close to the final. And I think it's great if in the process we can collect information on rentals so that they can be regulated by the state because the state really wants to help out making sure everybody's living in safe conditions so they have no say over single family houses. Once it's a rental building, they, can, they have state power. <laughs> So who would do that? The tax map and the 911 map and who who would 
So it's kind of that's currently got spread out a bit. We uh, we do the, we control the tax map, yeah. but there's a list on there that comes from the 911 statewide system. And right now, I believe Clyde is our 911 coordinator for the town. Yeah. So the 911 layer has one area of responsibility, say like that. But when it comes to people's actual addresses and stuff that you see on the tax map, that goes to our office. In some cases, in this, as in this case, uh, you know, it says in this case, we said nine number nine, and number nine C or something. That's what we have in our record, but that's not the 911 address, which is supposed to be based on the measurement from the road to mm -hmm. the driveway. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say that that system could use some improvement, you know, and, and as part of us doing a town wide reappraisal, we're like the first, I'll say, town entity really systematically going out looking at stuff and. I was like, wow, you know, you know, gee, this seems really off, you know. I don't understand. It was more of an observation, I'll say. I don't understand why Barbara Lane isn't two separate roads. I agree. I've talked to John Leonard, like, you should come up with a name for your road and petition it down and split that thing. And, you know, it hasn't happened. I mean, you know, there's a, I don't know what the mechanism is, but I'd say it's good. Having two Barbara Lanes is confusing. And where, where that originates from, whether the town says we're not going to call both of those, we're going to call this something else, or however it gets dealt with, I just think from a safety point of view, with nothing else. There should only be one road of the same name. We shouldn't have Barber Lane and Barber Avenue and Barber Street. It should be one. Is there, is there two signs there, Doug, that each say Barber Lane or not? No, it's one. See, I would say that John's would be just a driveway. It's too bad a long time ago there was a squabble there, and that's why there's two. Oh, is that right? But, 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 I mean, there's only a history behind yeah. why, how we got here. <laughs> However, at the end of the day, I believe that we should be following the 911 rules to make it easy for an emergency vehicle driver to get to someplace based on the miles of the road he's in. They got a system set up like this that we're not. So, in, in Clyde's defense, there, there's some wiggle in how you do that yep. because you don't know necessarily when a piece of, piece of land is bought where the front door is going to be and what you should measure to or where the driveway is going to go. But the <coughs> driveway, driveway permit it. comes into this as well. Um, For a lot of this stuff, I'll say, you know, I don't think we're getting a lot of new driveway permits. Now, this is what what has been, you know, and it's okay, it could be still tightening up, I think. Is, is there any way for people who don't want to be so well watched over? As long as you don't ever want to call for help. But that's it. The expectation will be that when they need help, somebody will show up. And yet, I mean, you know, so. There's a house that I won't, but there's a house that the only way to get to it is a cow path that we used to respond to regularly. And we all get to know it. I mean, it, where to park and how to walk up through the field. Um, and people choose to live that way, but they at least have an address so that we can reference it. And if they are causing a burden to their neighbors, they can be identified on what their yeah. address is. Are there any other town or roads in town that are, you know, two of the same name? Or is that it? No, but I think there's a lot of roads that should become private roads. And I know that Clyde started that process. So off of Sheep Road, there's at least two. You mean like dry lanes or driveway? Yeah, more than three dwellings on a driveway, it's supposed to be a private road. So there's multiple instances of that. But, and earlier this year, when it was kind of coming together, I suggested just because it was a reval year, we're all concerned about taxes and like, maybe we shouldn't change all these people's address just before we give them a new property assessment. So it didn't happen then, but, I, but it should happen. So there and a lot of the change about road numbering since the last time this has happened, I believe. So that right now we have a, our numbering system doesn't line up with the state standard right now, but all new roads must. So you could be on a shoot road coming off of a, a low number, let's say 85, I'm just picking a number, and meet and have a very short private road, and then the first house is number 100 or 120 or something because of the the, the correct modern standard to number. So that's going to be a little confusing if you know whenever those get all rolled up. But I think we have several other roads that 
meet that requirement. It's like now a driveway with multiple, more than three dwellings on it. That should happen, but it's a it's a bit of a process. You know, we're not we're not there. You know, we should be there. But so magic number is three. If there's three, I believe that's the point. There's three it needs to be coming. I don't. Over. I don't actually know. Oh, okay. I, I believe it's a three dwellings in one half town project. Has to be a, it becomes a road. Yeah. And I know that Clyde's been talking to people on the road for a while now. But I don't know what the latest thing is. And in some cases, they're trying to decide what the name would be. In other cases, there's other there's other issues there. But that's that's Clyde's big But we have been in communication the last couple of years about this as we run into things. We found other members that were incorrect that we did actually change. But we did get a chance to do all of the stuff in this room. We're also going to encounter resistance. You know, from looking at this from both sides, if you go up to somebody who's got a nine on their door, <coughs> say you're actually seven, they're going to be so what? Uh, you know, it's a. Uh, it, yeah. There's a. It, it's hard to tell somebody who's lived in a place for X number of years that their address needs to change. Like, we need a common method by which we can all do That's our right. jobs. That's right. yeah. To answer your question earlier, Gordon, you know, if the postman comes, or the UPS guy comes and drops with a heart attack on your property and yeah. he says, well, right. can you call 911? You're like, well, I'm not on that. <laughs> it's kind of tough to explain that one. Yeah. So. Yeah, I suppose it's some responsibility that goes along with everyone in this not. We actually have, just because of the, just another, it's more of a quirk, I'll say, but because of the 911 numbering system, we have some properties that the, the owner's house doesn't have a legitimate number because there's no room there. So right on Brownsville Road, there's five Brownsville Road. That's also seven Brownsville Road. And there's another building in the back that we call 7A, but that's not a legitimate 911 building indicator. But that's the best we can do with what we got. But on the 911 map, it doesn't show up. And that's actually where the people, the owner lives. Uh, yeah. So, John, um, how long have we had this 911 system? Uh, since before I moved into town, as far as I understand, but I, I don't know the answer. In, in Harlem, I don't know the answer. The 911 system in general is, I don't I, I don't have the I'm just thinking about Harlem. Hard, hard. Hard. I think it's like 20 years, maybe. That sounds about right. Yeah. So I, I just I'm questioning whether it's actually working better than not having it the way it used to work. Maybe people knew more. Maybe they had uh, better knowledge of where everybody lived. Well, as far as getting emergency services to where they need to be from outside towns and inside towns is a great yeah. universal system that tells you which side of the road to look on, whether it's odd or even, mm -hmm. and how far to drive before you should start looking for the house. I mean, that is that is a great, great system. Yeah. That gets people to your house in a hurry that are completely unfamiliar with the area. Yeah, because mutual aid, right? They're Absolutely. coming in, they have no right. idea. Yep. Mm -hmm. All of our ambulance services come from out of town. Yeah. They, they, were, they depend on it. Who's by the GPS, is that correct? Um, I don't know how far the signs are. But no, I mean the 911 works off GPS. It works off of mileage. Mileage, yeah. I think it's a mileage on the road to the end of your driveway. Yeah, we so. made it kind of simple with low numbers, and some other towns have four-digit numbers. Some people want three-digit numbers, so it's 100 Rice Road would be one mile up. In yeah. West Windsor, that would be 1,000 Rice Road, which gives you a few more numbers to throw out if it starts getting congested. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we're starting to get places where there's more driveways than available numbers. Uh -huh. Let's yeah. say more we'll stop. dwellings than right. available numbers. So I think most of the towns around us use a four-digit system. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's the state standard. We could use a decimal point. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. 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 But that's going to be a thing. Yeah. 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 And, uh, because I can see that being extremely difficult to change everybody's mind on one number. Mm -hmm. If every business, every check, every number, you get a change to your address. But on the other hand, there's 
start getting in, uh, private roads that pop up with a different numbering system than what the rest of the town has. Yeah. We know they'll be able to do something with the ABC or yeah. Yeah, point something or something rather than change the right numbers. Right? Well, do we want to talk about um, properties that are popping up? I mean, the building permit idea. Okay. Um, and off the emergency bar on to what your thoughts are about um, how it will work if people have to get a permit to start construction. Uh, well, I think a successful permit system would have a very low or no cost to do the right thing. With the upfront understanding, that what, what other places do is, and we'll see what Two Rivers comes up with, but typically uh, on a building permit form, it, it just, it, there's some boilerplate on there that says things like you're giving the listers permission to go and look at the new building that you're putting up, and <coughs> be evaluated for tax purposes, on your new building and stuff like that. But the idea would be, we're just trying to find out about your new building. We're, there's no concern about, as David said, but, you know, setbacks or color or any other kind of stuff. It's just like, if you're building something over 100 square feet, you'd like to know about it. And then I think there needs to be some kind of penalty that's enough of a spank that makes people do it. But I don't know what those numbers are, but I think that's part of the successful system. Um, because we're trying, there needs to be a penalty. If you, I, I, the way I could see implementing something like this would be to say, you start off with some kind of forgiveness period. You say, all right, since the last reappraisal, since you've been to your house, if you built something bigger than 100 square feet, let us know now, or in the next month or something, and we'll just pick it up like that. But then afterwards, you put a system in place, and now there's a penalty for not telling us. Because when we do find out, there's got to be some repercussion. And I think there needs to, to go along with that, there needs to be the, the sincere will to do that. To, because enforcing town ordinances is a, it can be a tricky thing, and I'm not advocating a new ordinance that we're not really gonna enforce. Um, because that's gonna, so that's gonna be tough. Those first 10 cases, it's gonna be really hard to say, no, you never do that. And there needs to be a system that's who's going to make that decision about that. Who, you know, that that'll be part of a successful system, I think. So if it's well structured, well defined, it's who's making what decisions, how that works, um, I think those are the components of a good system. How about a driveway culvert? That seems to be problematic for our roads when people build places they don't put in culvert, and then that affects the town road. So I think, are you thinking about that? Part of the permit. So I, I actually, Doug and I have had this conversation. I think that you know, on some of these properties, you know, it may have been an existing property, or you know, there may have been something there. But you know, I think I've had two or three driveway permits in a year and a half. Okay. So. So not only are they not coming in for you know. You know, not only do we not know that they're there from assessing point of view, but you know, obviously, it's driveway permits not really a part of it either. But again, there may be an existing road or something that they utilized, but um, you know, again, there's 36 new houses there, and yeah, we don't need a permit for a town road. So for a state road, you don't need it, and a private road, you don't need it. So well, you need a state permit on a state road. Yes, but. Yeah. But it's not necessarily always going through the town. I did that. <coughs> Does that get reported to the town? I don't. I've never had the state tell me that somebody is putting a new driveway on a state road. I've seen it. Well, they didn't know what's going on. No, but theoretically, when I mean, you got at least on the town roads, people are supposed to get a driveway permit. Then you would know you had right. something. That's right. So I, I know that there's a driveway permit system, but I think between, just like all the other stuff, it's not maybe as tight as it could be, and it's not a good indicator because Dave's only had two or three new ones. And like you said, either the driveway was already in there or it's a private road or something, but we don't. Well, that might cover some of them, but I think some of yeah. them just haven't happened. 
on the state road if they're building a building that they need that driveway for, you would get it through a permitting process at the end of the But the town doesn't necessarily get well, I, I don't know, I don't know if you get them, I don't see anything from the state. Um, no, no, all I'm saying is if they're, what I'm saying is the permitting process would fix that loophole. Where Absolutely. Yes, they wouldn't have to ask for a driveway permit, but they would still have to, there'd still be a process to follow to check off all the other boxes. Right. Because mm, yeah. without, without a driveway, without, a, me, without some sort of building permit system, and as a system, I, I've got no input. I'm forced to be very inefficient to go find a new structure. I either driving around or looking on a three-year-old satellite map, or and I don't want to be pulling up in anybody's driveway and driving around seeing when you get new in here. That's, that's very interesting. I think most people would feel that. But by having a, something systematic that just lets us streamline our work and you know get the best value for our money for what we're trying to do, instead of forced to work in an inefficient way. Do you have any thoughts about what a substantial penalty would be? How that would work? <clears throat> so if the cost of a permit is something like 10 or 20 bucks, just enough to pay the people to process it, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know. I, a few hundred bucks, something that you're going to say, look, you know, it's like... In one way, it's like putting a lock on your front door. You're keeping honest people honest. If there's some burglary going to get in your house, he's going to get in your house. Maybe you lock the doors and bump the windows. But we're trying to, you know, we're trying to help people do the right thing. And, and I, I believe, like I said, it's, it's going to be enough of a spank that you're like, man, I'm going to not, I don't want to get that penalty. I want to do the right thing instead. But it can't be outrageous, you know. But once the question off the cuff is yeah. we ran into this with the burn permit our ordinance where people are doing their legal burn. Yeah. I think our ordinance is you will first receive a written warning and then you will receive a fine. And we were having a hard time keeping the ordinance up with the times. So the fine was like three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we updated that ten years ago and now it's fifty or hundred dollars or something more impactful. But with the permit process it might make sense to instead of put a value down in the permit, maybe say X percent of the of the property assessed property that's added or something like that yeah. so that it's it's substantial enough that you understand that there's a reason to play along. That's a great idea. That's a great example. So it just needs to be enough of a deterrent for really trying to just guide people to do this. And then whether you you know and that so let's say we have this free period, like just tell us what you did and then that next year we or a year and a half later we find somebody with a barn we didn't have and didn't tell us and you know I would assume you put that up the day after I was here last, you know. <laughs> I'd go back and bam, nail it, you know. It's getting to be a thing, so it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, I, I think this, I don't want to be ridiculous about it, but it, it has to be enough to be effective to you know, people. It's one thing to get a permit to build a house, but when somebody wants to put up a, could be just a play yard, playhouse for their kids, and it happened to be 10 by 12 instead of just 10 by 10. And they wouldn't think to get a permit. There ought to be some kind of forgiveness here for people to make an honest mistake. Sure. Because I, I, yeah, I, I don't know that's, that's going to happen. A structure that nobody knows about, like, like a, build, a brand new building. Yeah, but so we have, let's say we have, in, in town we have, that, we have that range, the whole gamut of grandpa built a playhouse for his kids and it was really nice and he didn't tell us and it's like, oh yeah, okay, that's what it was. As opposed to people who building, living, avoiding, on purpose. that's a different on purpose, that's a different, yes. it's a whole different sport. That's right. But we're trying to help honest people be honest. We're trying to make the function of, this function of the town more efficient and it's not unreasonable, I, I will say, to ask for a building permit system for purposes of taxation, because we're trying to be fair and equitable. And they're using resources that people are paying for, so that we don't have enough resources paying for the extra kids in the school or the extra kids mm -hmm. at the rec center. Mm -hmm. Or, as they said, the town employees trying to trying to help the people in town. Mm -hmm. They're using resources, but they're not helping to pay for. Mm -hmm. So, John, did you find that recent illegal burn? Did you find them? Um, so there's a, there's a number of things that are happening there. Um, he was too tired to answer the door. 
So. Uh, so we were we found that residents not because of the 911 address. He was called in from people driving down the interstate and reporting flames up on the hill. So we actually responded to the interstate and spent our time um, at risk on the interstate during 6:30 traffic fighting that fire up on the hill. The neighboring towns we were able to report that they should go to Gilson Farm Road and hit it from the other side of the fence. But it was on the interstate side of the interstate fence. So the fire was started in a trash pile on the, on the, pro on the property and spread up into the woods. I copied the fire wardens that I know on that email and they put me in touch with the Vermont um, Environmental Enforcement Officer who responded to take care of it and I don't know how that mm -hmm. went but you said but earlier, usually my, my mode of operation is usually an email to Dave and our constable saying, this happened, can you please send them a letter? Because most of the time you talk to these people and they're, they're very reasonable and they're like, oh, I didn't know this, you know, I'm sorry, I'll call you next time, who do I call? And now they've got a letter, so if they're repeat offenders, you can oh. at least say, we've sent you a letter. Now it's $3. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... What's the average cost to respond with uh, three towns to a fire? Uh, well, but it's more than yeah. You can, you can, yeah. Come on up. Wow, that's a way to put the uh, figure on the fine right there. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. You can't squeeze blood out of a stone. <laughs> so. No, but sometimes a stone isn't a stone; it's a sponge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Can I make one comment? Sure. I'm not saying this to start an argument or anything, but new building permit or not, I think there's a lack of communication internally with, I'll use McLaughlin's house, how many town employees have been through there. Some, someone shouldn't have, someone should have known there wasn't a driveway permit. You know, I, I don't know if you can just, in your monthly meetings, bring up things. Boy, I see a, I saw 20 dump trucks go by. I see a lot of activity. You know, there's, I mean, because you're going to have to know what's going on in town with a new ordinance or not. I mean, you can have a new ordinance and still not, still people can build. So I don't know. I think there's room for improvement either way. I agree, but I still see the valley truck going by the lumber, and I want to go follow it. <laughs> and I can't because I have I get phone call. You know, well, somebody knew where it went, though. So I mean, but I can't call the valleys. But anyways, um, I, I take your point, and, and I do agree. We do talk about stuff, but also we're, we're trying to make our best with our resources, and I. I feel like it would be irresponsible of me to not, to not uh, ask for this stuff because it's going to make things so much easier and streamlined and more efficient on behalf of the whole town. I look at that kind of like, that's an interesting analogy. You know, let me draw this one, which is you're not supposed to steal. That's the law. And the, generally people follow that. But if somebody sees somebody walking out of the mic stealing candy, they should report it. I think that's all we're at. I mean, just because you see it going on doesn't mean that should be the primary mode of reporting it. There should be a, a set of rules that are followed before you can say, hmm, let's keep it better. Yeah, I don't think you should put the onus on the, on the uh, town employees to be right. doing that. Centuries. Yeah, yeah. It's so you're going to have a new ordinance and the same thing can still go on. Well, why, why wouldn't why wouldn't I say, well, there's a new house going up on, have you been there, Doug? That's what I still can Yeah, you still I mean, can do that. Yes, you still can do well, that. Well, first of all, so there's, there's, there's no co driveway permit, so why wouldn't I stop and say to that homeowner, you haven't got a driveway permit? So let me just answer it this way, if I can. Um, there, there's a fractured system in place now. So you got Clyde doing 911. You got the Listers doing, you know, assessing value when they come across these properties. You got Bill going out there, and the last thing on his mind is 
you know, what's going on as far as a house there. It's usually, you know, something else regarding a road or something to that effect. Um, but even if Bill was noticing that house being built and, you know, brought it back, you got a system that, uh, again, is, is fairly inefficient and is work on behalf of the town employees, let me put it another way, you know, it seems as though the town has high expectations of the town employees. Um, we always, you know, feel as though this can be done or that can be done. You have the resources to do that or the amount of work to carry that out is probably twice of what, it, you know, it's going to take to actually do it. So again, it's the listers going out, you know, road by road, doing that when they could be back assessing property and, and piecing that together. You got Clyde doing 911. Um, we haven't even touched on, you know, the rentals, driveway permits, the junkyard ordinance, the floodplain bylaws, the other things that come into play here is that um, what I've been essentially preaching is a structure in place to kind of help pull this together, to essentially supplement the pieces that are in place um, with more of a focus. You know, so that letter that needs to go out to that person that just burned up the hillside is supposed to come from me. You know, just imagine if I had 38 driveway permits to actually process, I mean, I'm thankful I've only got the three. You know, seriously, do I really have time to do and go out to do 38 driveway permits? No, I don't. Does Bill have that time at the moment? No, he doesn't either. You know, so um, it's just the, the pieces, there's, there's fractured pieces in place. It may have worked 30 years ago. Again, with what's going on today, I think that it is, it's struggling to um, come to fruition. Could some of this, or, you know, again, the, the 50 properties did get picked up, you know, but they're obviously looking at what's going on here from 30,000 feet. It's, I would say it's extremely, it's almost laughable, you know, to have the development that's going on, you know, unchecked, not hitting the grant list. Houses that we can't respond to or we can't even get to um, is dangerous and, you know, we talked about potholes all day long and how we need to be grading potholes, but this is a different subject that we're not doing effectively or efficiently. And I think that I've talked about an assistant or I've talked about delegation of duties that people can actually focus on what's going on. And I think that that's part of the equation of what needs to happen here is that we need, you know, more focus. It's not going to come from me. I'm actually letting a lot of this go, you know, junkyard and other things that are out there. Uh, I got other things to concentrate, bigger things to concentrate. The Worcester just came through a reappraisal that was extremely difficult um, and time consuming. And Clyde's got other things as well. So, you know, it, it's a system that, you're right, Matt, doesn't work effectively. It doesn't work efficiently. I think that's the point. Had, had 23 people come in applying for a driveway, yep. and you were stressed about not being able to keep up with it, we would have a better chance of hiring an assistant because there would be a definite need in front of us. So the fact that they're not coming in for the permits is means we don't need an assistant? That means what? That's how it, no, it yeah, doesn't mean we don't need one. It means we're not getting one. It means we don't deal with it. Um, I'm not saying we don't need one. It is not, I, I think the point here is we've got a system that is, it, it is ineffective. I think it is fractured. I think Matt's got a point. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, asking your town employees to do X amount more, I, I think will incrementally help that. I think that, you know, more communication and more teamwork will, will would help that, but, I think, you know. the, uh, I think the reason we have a driveway permit had little to do with finding new buildings. I think it had to do with building the road in the right place and building it correctly. I don't think it was so much what we're talking about now. Sarah wanted to make a comment. Sarah. I wanted to add that the 
and Dave has really okay. dealt with it and was my voice and has dealt with deeply. But I also wanted to remind you that beginning last December, a group of community members who are not elected town officials have been looking at these same issues, having the same kind of conversation, and are very much supportive of the concept that Heartland has outgrown its current infrastructure. And to be fair in mm -hmm. terms of the, our, our property assessment and taxation um, system, in order to be fair that people are contributing to the services they're receiving, in order to be safe, that we do need to think of ourselves as being the town of 3,500, that we are not a town of 2,000, which is what we were when these structures were put into place. Mm -hmm. If you look at a map of population shifts in Vermont, there's been some new maps that have come out in the last month. We're one of the few towns that's actually gaining population outside of Chittenden County. And um, we see where it's coming. Yeah, and the other thing that's bad about it, it isn't around here, it's up there right. for the most part, which is unfortunate. Um, well, it's just the economy that makes that happen. But, but I think what I'm trying to communicate is that there is support for acting like the size town that we are. Yeah. And I would agree with Matt, the communication <coughs> is a huge issue and I would but I would might frame it a little bit differently. All of these things we're talking about changing potentially if we were to go about changing some of the ways in which we work within the town, there'll have to be a whole communication campaign to have people be able to know and understand. I mean, right now I think the town does a great job of things like, you know, I, I know who to call up now about a fire. You know, if I wanted to have a fire because it's posted on the town website. Um, I found it there. Um, and it's in other places, in, in posters in the community. You can find information you need. But there'll be new information if we make changes and we'll have to find ways to communicate it. Um, one thing that bothers me, I think more than anything else, is the um, Lack of trust, I guess, and honesty. That if we if we say you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do that. And, and in the past, we were able to rely on people's honest nature to come forth on things like the house that uh, Matt just mentioned. Uh, most people, they could. There's no way they could know or could not know that they owed taxes to the town after living in a house for two years. I mean, it just isn't. But that's unusual. I, I'm a believer that there's a, a, a better system overall if everybody can be trustworthy rather than assuming everybody is dishonest and we have to keep track of them. That bothers me about having what we're talking about. I mean, people should come in and tell you they built something. Some people can forget. That's understandable. But most everybody knows that we do tax buildings in town. And we're supposed to be getting away with something. But it's not just this, it's everything in our society is just watched over way too much. There's also, I guess, legal versus ethical stuff. So, yeah. So this house owner who's had a house for four years and knew about it, he's like, I'm, I'm not going to tell on myself, is what he told us, I'm going for you guys to do your job and find me. Right. So, He's legally absolutely right, and you can't go back because and go get past taxes on. He's legally correct. Our office did not find his property. That's the law. But if we were more enabled and had something like a permit system or something, agree that that's a, a flyer. You know, it's an outlier. I hope so. But we would have. You know, there's a lot of development in town. 
it just makes sense from a system's point of view. Yeah. Well, that's we a have a reporting system yeah. so we know where to focus our efforts on. It's yeah. also, though, it's if not he was called. ethical, he would have... <laughs> right. It's not calling him a liar. It's as John said, it's the law. Yeah. It's just the ordinance of the town. You walk into BG's, you have to pay for the food before you leave. Yeah. Well, you move into town, you go on the town website, it says what you have to do. You need a driveway permit, you need a building permit. And it's just that simple. It's not calling him a liar. It's not calling him a thief. It's telling him what we expect of a citizens of the town of Hartford. That's all it's asking. Yeah, you actually could go to Beaches and put it in your pocket and walk out. So you probably could. So <laughs> probably could. I it has sleep. to be your encouragement to give you. I wouldn't no, sleep at night. It has to be some trust. That's what I'm getting Absolutely. At. And that's all this is doing. You're going to have the people that are going to, like you have a lock on your door. You have a lock to keep the burglars out. It keeps the honest people out. Awesome. Beaches does not say we don't have um, a clerk up here to pay you. Just leave whatever you want. Some people do. There's a clerk there to check you to see that you're not working out things no. that aren't yours. Yeah. And it's a process that's easily followed, and I think that's what we need to absolutely look at. It's some sort of process. It's not. It's not calling you a liar. It's just you know. It's come come in and tell us about your construction so that you can be treated fairly like everybody else in the town. I agree that the absolute majority of people in town are honest and Absolutely. I've enjoyed work with them. But that last five percent takes up a lot of oxygen. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what this is about. My, all the people who join right now. Yeah. Well what I, what I, my point is I think is not to not to uh, in the face or well, send the wrong message to the ninety five percent. But the 95% who pay their taxes faithfully want to know that we are addressing those other 5%. Yeah, five, yes. And, you know, yeah. I mean, the person, the, That's true. the people who have lived in Heartland without paying taxes just boggles my mind. And then the one who went without paying taxes and then grieved to you guys <laughs> and then went to the BCA, I, I mean, that takes on. Unimaginable gall, you know, just or no, just you have white cross sections of citizens here. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. I've been dealing with some stuff for a few years now, so I'm getting a taste of it. Yeah. But, oh. Could I ask if, if um, anybody knows that uh, in Windsor County how many towns have and how many towns don't have uh, building permits requirements? No idea. I don't believe we know the answer. The rivers would probably know that stuff. Because this seems to me an issue that you know towns have been dealing with for a long time. As as you know, they change from being tiny little Vermont towns into towns that you know attracting a lot of outside people. So, yeah, metropolises. Yeah. We're thriving metropolis now. We have to adapt. Well, um, so I don't know just where this discussion is leading us. But yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure we're going to talk about it again, so I, I suggest we move on. Yeah, because we've got something in that uh, two rivers are supposed to be bringing us a sample. Uh, yeah, right. Just how quickly it depends on quickly we hear on the grant. It's just a little Yeah, so this, this process is in the works. Super. And uh, so, and it's good to talk it's about it. I think maybe we've talked long enough. Yep. Are you sure? It's, uh, it's worth serious discussion, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys for coming in. Really appreciate it. I've got my number posted just FYI. Right. It's on my house and it's yeah, correct. It's I don't know, I think so. You <laughs> 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 just said we overpaid for about twenty years and the reassessment finally put us where we should be. So very happy. That's good. Yeah. So I guess we're done with this discussion. I don't know where it's taken. We don't have a no motions meeting or anything. It's been a good discussion. Okay. And thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yes.
We'll be talking about it some more. So where are we? <laughs> I thought Dave Singer was already the health he officer. The no, here's Bob. Was showing him the ropes. Bob. Yeah, here's the oh. uh, assistant. Oh, yeah. assistant. Oh, okay. So now we have to just <coughs> recommend him or like appoint him. You need to recommend. Oh, okay. Um, the state actually appoints, but you recommend the oh. state. Does and Gordon just um, take care of it, or do we need a, a motion? Um, you should have a motion to, <coughs> to recommend them, and then you can sign the bottom. I'll fill in the other stuff, but okay. you can sign the bottom there. Um, and he has got... So it's okay. you are. interesting process. So Bob's term runs up October 31st. He will just essentially step aside. He doesn't need to do anything. Dave Singer has been <coughs> the alternate, so he needs to actually resign as the alternate. I've got his resignation here, and basically stating that he would be, if recommended, he would accept the recommendation. Here. For November 1st? For November 1st, yep. Um, and that kind of goes as a packet to the state, and then they take that and process it and do whatever they, whatever they do. All right, I make a motion that we recommend David Singer as the new health officer starting November 1st, 2019. Uh, 2019. <coughs> I was dyslexic there for a second. Yes, you were. I second that motion. Yeah, I agree. So that's everybody. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> Last 20 years. That would be bad. Dave, do you have some notes? I've got one question about the health officer. Should we be looking for an assistant for him? Should be. I think he should have, we should ask him if he wants. He should probably have somebody in case he's See you, John. away or Thank something. Thank you. Probably be good to have a second person. Yeah. Because if he's even out of town, you know. Yep. I agree. Uh, town manager update. Is that where you're at? Mm hmm. Uh -huh. Um, Travis Beebe is going to join the highway department. Oh. Oh. That's a very familiar name. Mm -hmm. uh, it is um, Alan, is it Alan Beebe's mm -hmm. son, mm -hmm. uh, who's been over at Hartford. Uh, he's going to come join us October 21st. Um, he will be, he'll be our next member. He does have a CDL license, um, so that'll go a little bit smooth uh, or smoother, but certainly um, he has driven a 10-wheeler, but um, yeah, you know the plow experience will still need to need to come into that. So um, you know, with both Zach and um, Travis, they'll be relatively new um, into the plowing. So that'll just be something we need to keep an eye out on. But um, I think he'll fit in. I'm glad to see him put yeah. his application in, and, yeah. and um, we'll move on. Um, just a couple of things that aren't on the, the typed up uh, update that they given you. So hazard mitigation, the local hazard mitigation plan needs to be updated. Um, it's kind of something that happens in the background. But it is important because that um, ups are, it's called an ERAF, um, the state uh, percentage, so during a FEMA event, um, we get a larger state percentage of the payout. Um, and again, I've been here two years and we've had two of these events, so um, having that larger payoff certainly pays, uh, it pays off. Uh, and it also uh, opens us up to some mitigation 
um, grant money, which is where we may end up uh, looking for the Jennyville culvert that uh, has been causing us problems over the years. Um, because FEMA will not pick that up uh, as it stands, but it certainly would fall under the state mitigation money. Um, we talked about the rec center. I think that was a big one. Um, delinquencies are down to 55,200, but we still have 35. Um, that's a very high number still. Um, but that's for the 55s. 35, exactly. So there, you know, in the past where we've had some that owed significance, yeah. you know, we're down to, we talked about the mobile home owners or those that are one year delinquent. There are a few troublesome delinquencies that, so we'd be seeing that that didn't pay, say in February and then are still having trouble, um, would get picked up. There's a few in there that are <coughs> a decent amount. Um, so we'll be eyeing that going towards, um, you know, again, we'll probably do it, uh, you know, late next spring, um, kind of like we did this year, uh, going into, you know, and we started the process in like May, June, ended up having the, the sale in mid-August. Um, I'm going to meet with, um, we talked a little bit about this, I think this is just important to go over, uh, the Three Corners Intersection Project. Um, we had a little bit of a discussion. I, I haven't set it up yet, but I need to go over and meet with the gentleman at the mansion. Uh, because that will kind of dictate, so they're, they're putting the finishing touches on if we do a complete burial on the design work, remember we wanted to come out to the to the to the poles. Uh, we would probably need to get an easement from 11 Route 12, this house over here. Um, but it is enough. We've got some decent figures, but we'll ask everybody to look at those figures and to update their estimates, give us the concrete estimates. It's a lot to ask these people to give us the estimates on. The shortcut if the guy isn't willing to participate in that discussion. So meeting with him is an important component of you know moving forward. I think that part of this discussion was is that we would look at the two alternatives. Um, so knowing whether that alternative is indeed an option is important to this. So I do need to take that step rather soon and have that discussion with him and kind of flesh out as to, you know, his desire to participate in that. I've been over there and looked at it. Um, from his view, what's there now is admittedly an eyesore. Um, so whether moving the pole, one pole towards his property would be more or less um, is kind of subjective and up to him, but um, it's important that that conversation happen. You eyeball uh, tree cutting? Uh, he's going to need tree cutting on both sides of that pole, which would thin that out, which is also a concern. I, I, if there were, I'm just thinking going, especially going north direction. Going north, big trees. Going north in particular and going south yeah. but, uh, would, would thin that out. So he is, he is affected. And it is a new order. It's a bad so, idea. Um, okay. But I think that's important to, yes. you know, take that step because that was kind of an important component of that discussion. So I think that that, you know, and again, I'd hate to have those utilities go through that legwork and the guy was never interested to begin with. Um, Tractor discussion, hopefully next meeting or um, in early November um, on some pricing on tractors and um, putting a new tractor in place for next spring, summer um, with the roadside mowing um, is important. I'm coming down the pike. One last thing, I do meet Wednesday with um, Tim Rockwood. Um, Rob Andreag and George Burns from Twin State over uh, at um, the 17 acre parcel. There's been some discrepancy in that property line off and on for a little bit. 
Um, Tim Rockwood seems to think he can, you know, identify pretty well where the battery is by a GPS type device and, um, you know, kind of, you know, identify better um, what, what the issue might be over there. But um, you'll have, hopefully have George there and, and you know, Tim and just kind of have that conversation. We'll, you know, see what happens. Tim. I was going to ask about the rec center roof. See, the rec center roof is going well. Um, rec center roof, he still has, um, he put us on hold for a short while. Um, he has done most of the roof. If you're looking at the rec center, to the right side of the overhang needs to be done. He's patched and done the other side, and um, he's done the windows in the back as well, where the sills were all kind of rotted out, and those have been done. Um, he put one window back in that cracked, so we'll have to redo that window, but um, that work is, I was expecting him today with the rain. I, I, I don't believe he came back with the rain. So. Did, he, did he run into anything he wasn't expecting, or was it? Um, other than the, you know, um, no, more or less. No, other good. than the fact that it needed, you know, a little attention underneath, and, and it has been a little bit since the, the roof tiles, for lack of a better term, have been kind of maintained. But other than that, it's it's not that bad. It's really good. Pretty good. Okay. He fixed the, uh, there was kind of a, on the overhang, there was kind of a, uh, tile or two that were kind of misplaced, um, not quite placed, you know, with the wind and the elements, the ice and stuff, it kind of pushed them around a little bit, and it was kind of a hole in the, the soffit underneath. There was kind of a bird's nest, et cetera. <laughs> That's been patched up and, um, well, and um, um, it's good work. I mean, again, this guy came to us through Chris Cole, and he seems to, um, <coughs> You know, their methods are kind of, you know, with historic buildings to, you know, not intrude unless you need to. I think it seems to be working. And the sale is still, still on? sale is still. It's actually more than, I believe it's more than set for the 21st of October. I've seen some paperwork go from Mr. Namby to the purchaser's lawyer. Um, the bank loan, I believe, has come through. Um, so that seems to be, seems to be moving forward.